What is up guys, Wrestling Premiere is here, and it's about damn time that I do a Wrestlemania video. The reason why these Wrestlemania videos are spread out is because of the fact that they're so damn hard to make. I am whining or anything, I'm just trying to explain why, but don't worry, others will come later this month. I still want to do 19, 21, and possibly two others, don't count on it though. We still got a long month ahead of us, so don't worry. Now regarding this Wrestlemania, the main event was tasked with the job of either making or breaking the event, and it did the latter. Had the last match delivered, our whole perception of Wrestlemania 25 would be totally different to what it is today. It's insane to me how one match dictates whether or not this WrestleMania was good. Because if you take it away and look at the event as a whole, add some decent matches, you know, Money in the Bank, it's a gem. Hardy vs. Hardy was good. The world title match wasn't bad, and the HBK Taker match, well, <laughs> you already know. It lacked another great match to elevate it, I'd say. But anyways, let's go back to 2009. I remember thinking this was going to be the logo for the event back in 2008. Personal experiences, I loved watching WWE at this point. They of course just went PG, but it wasn't as bad as it would be by year's end. Chris Jericho was the MVP of Raw in my eyes, whereas SmackDown you can say whoever the hell you want, except for this guy or this guy. I find memories of SmackDown mostly, and Raw on the other hand, like, I don't recall watching too much of it. Whenever I did miss it though, they played it on the Spanish channel on Sunday, it was cool. This WrestleMania was being promoted as the 25th anniversary of the event. Some say it's actually 24. The WWE showed a bunch of classic WrestleMania highlights in anticipation of the big event on April 5th. The build for the world title match was odd. HBK Taker was cool, and the main event was probably top 5 of WrestleMania in terms of building it up. Enough talk, let's dive into it. WrestleMania 25 was held in the Reliance Stadium, not the Astrodome, on April 5th, 2009. 72,744 were in attendance to witness a snooze fest of a main event, and the buy rate was 960,000, which was down from WrestleMania 24, which drew over a million. The theme songs for the event were Shoot to Thrill by ACDC, War Machine by ACDC, Touched by Vast, I believe, So Hot by Kid Rock, and Crash by Decipher Down. Anyways, let's get into it. WrestleMania 25. Oh, oh, WrestleMania. The intro gave me some mad SVR 10 vibes. You know, reminds me of that road to WrestleMania. And the show kicked off with Nicole Scherzinger performing America the Beautiful. Pyro goes off. JR introduces everyone to WrestleMania, and the show's on. The first match was the annual Money in the Bank ladder match. You know the rules. Winner challenges any champion of their choosing. CM Punk doing decent in the mid card at this point. Mark Henry doing well on ECW. MVP who was finally a babyface. Finley who was putting over talent at this point, Shelton Benjamin, who had a good run, Kofi Kingston, the rising star, Christian, good-ass pop from the crowd and was back home in WWE, Kane, put over talent, but at the same time was a force to be reckoned with, or the competitors in this match. So that bell rings, everyone bronzes one another, let's go, Christian chants intensify as Mark Henry's trying to wear down Kane. Shelton and Christian run in and knock down the Giants when Kofi all of a sudden shows his athletic ability. Ladder set up, Kane boots Finley and the two big guys climb the rungs. Small guys return and manage to get rid of them, they all fight atop the ladders, reaching for that briefcase, but the same guys that got thrown out return the favor. It was already a fun affair, those two go at it again and damn was the ref close to getting it. Suicide dive from Finley, nice flashback to 08 with Punk and Kingston diving through the ropes and to top it all off. Shelton Benjamin hits a flip off this tall ass ladder and yes, that is a WrestleMania moment right there. Hell, even Mark Henry was looking to hit something but Finley ruined everything. Hornswoggle lets his ego get the best of him and kinda frost splashes the other guys. And during this juncture of the match, I'd say Finley, well I'm wrong, it was actually Kofi that's got the advantage. It's a cool ass trouble in paradise on Finley who's climbing the rungs but again, Mark Henry makes his presence felt. Despite this, Kofi Kingston almost managed to score the W with an impressive attempt at climbing the ladder, but Henry caught him with the world's strongest slam. Then MVP and Shelton Benjamin have a little entertaining battle, and again, Benjamin crashed and burned. As MVP climbs up, CM Punk ruins everything. Christian comes in and catches him with a kill switch. The crowd's going crazy awesome stuff. MVP once again reaches the top, only for Shelton to come from somewhere and attempt a sunset flip that goes Ari. He has enough and decides to launch MVP right into both Tony Atlas and Mark Henry. He climbs up top and delivers some rough-ass strikes to Finley, forcing him off the ladder. And I certainly know who the MVP of this match is, and it's not Montel. Unfortunately for himself, he was pushed off the top of the ladder by Christian. Fans go crazy, but those cheers turn into boos when CM Punk runs in. He almost loses that battle, but Kane makes the rescue by choke slamming Captain Charisma off the ladder. Those two fight atop it. Punk shows more heart with a repeated kicks to the monster, forcefully pushing him down to the mat. He then retrieves the briefcase, and CM Punk was once again Mr. Money in the Bank. Two years in a row. Wow. 
This is one of those Money in the Bank matches that I forget about, you know. It was a fun match from top to bottom. They made the most out of the time given, and there wasn't a match that could open WrestleMania like this one. Regarding the winner, it's odd to me how WWE chose CM Punk to win this one. For one, he captured the briefcase last year, and even CM Punk himself thought it was an unexpected win. In my opinion, there was one choice that was better than CM Punk, and that was Christian. I think he could have made for a cool story with Captain Charisma cashing in on Edge sometime in the future, but I'm glad we got heel Punk cashing in on Jeff. Good match. As a matter of fact, you could really give it to any of those guys, and they'd be made men. Like Shelton Benjamin, he had a decent run, and had he won the briefcase here, who knows, he might have be finally became champion. Following this, Detroit City's Kid Rock performance, what is this, 2000? I'm just joking. Kid Rock had a hit song in 2008, so he was doing somewhat well at this point. He performed some of his greatest hits, including Bow with the Bow, whatever the hell it's called, Rock and Roll Jesus, the most recent hit all summer long, and all of a sudden the Divas come on, it's time for the Miss WrestleMania Battle Royal. A bunch of past and present performers were involved in this match. Hell, even the likes of Miss Jackie and Joy Giovanni were in this match. Notable returns included Tori Wilson, Molly Holly, Sonny, and Victoria, and I completely forgot this was WrestleMania. Like, Kid Rock was given a 20-minute performance or something, with the way things when Trish Stratus was right in declining in appearance. There was, however, a rumor that she was facing Michelle McCool, but that didn't go down. Also, I find it funny how Justin Roberts was announced in the match all while the Divas are pushing each other out of the ring. Mae Young was a guest timekeeper, I should know. Yeah, Battle Royals are awesome, but this ain't it. The match lacks excitement and action, you know, Sonny's thrown out, Rosa Mendez is gone, Marina gets slapped out of the match, Gail Kim botches a Hurakurana, I assume, and the commentary team had nothing to talk about. I'm not talking about Jerry Lawler, of course, because he was drooling. Molly Holly was made to be an afterthought, like she was one of the best women's wrestlers of the 2000s, yet they made her disappear like that. She should have been in the final four. Tori Wilson, one of the most popular, I don't know where the hell she went, and the match wasn't even over the top rope. The ring ended up being cleared after 20 seconds, and Michelle and Mickey go at it. Now it's finally serious. They push each other out, and three are remain. Beth and Melina battle, and the diva who Jerry Lawler called the ugliest he's ever seen, steals it. Santino chants intensify all while Beth Phoenix is looking to whoop his ass. Nobody knew who this person was, and they announced themselves as Santino's brother. Yeah, no, this wasn't good. Not as a match, nor the story. Like, Santino gets jello and enters the match. This should have been something for one of the others to win. Like, he should have just gotten thrown out by Beth Phoenix and she'd win it then and there. And it's definitely a low point of the Divas division. Like, they brought back all that talent for literally nothing. Two minutes of whatever. It's definitely the worst match of the night. They chose Kid Rock in this weak-ass battle royal over a, a fun tag team match. Like, that's a damn shame. They were building that story for weeks, and it culminated on the pre-show of WrestleMania, and it was for the Unified Tag Team Championships also. I haven't seen a battle royal this bad in a very long time. The next match was a three-on-one handicap match. Chris Jericho faces the legends of yesteryear. Jimmy Snuka, Hot Rod Roddy Roddy Piper, and the return of the greatest in-ring performer, probably, of the late 80s, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. The story of this one was much deeper. For some reason, Chris Jericho was trashing the legends and they were going to do something about it. Ric Flair led the team of three into the match with Y2J, but one thing to know is that this wasn't the initial plan. You see, Chris Jericho was pegged to face Mickey Rourke at the big show. Problem is, his representatives didn't want him in the ring... But there was, however, one memorable segment to come out of this on CNN back in January or February of 2009, but it didn't lead to the showdown. However, Mickey Rourke was there in attendance, and he had made a comeback to the big screens with the iconic wrestler movie that I thoroughly enjoyed watching. It was a roller coaster ride that I suggest you watch because, man, it's excellent. It shows the struggles of a past wrestler and whatever. Also, at the time, there was these huge-ass rumors that Hulk Hogan was gonna face Chris Jericho. This whole Legends thing was leading to that, but it never materialized. As for the Legends, they couldn't really work at this age, except for one of them. Steamboat didn't have a Chicago Bulls song, but whatever. Piper is still somewhat unbelievable that he passed away, you know. It just feels off because we've seen the guy make 100 appearances in the few years preceding his death. With that said, Chris Jericho had enough of these guys stealing a spotlight and the bell rings. Piper starts things off with Y2J, marches towards his opponent with strikes, kick, claws onto the outside, and Jericho fights back, but at least to nothing as Piper hits a drop kick, one-legged. Snuka wants in and he delivers some soft-ass punches. Steamboat's in and the fans were certainly excited. He gets a little axe handle, awesome arm drags giving flashbacks to his in-ring career, and damn, the difference between Steamboat and the others was night and day. Snooka ended up tapping to the walls and so two were left. Piper quickly brings the attack, little eye poke, the sleeper, and the fans cheer, but Jericho escapes and hits a running into Guri. One, two, 
three. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat is back in, and he hits a nice-ass crossbody getting a near fall. JR in commentary stated that if he was to lose at WrestleMania to these legends, it would certainly be the most embarrassing moment of his career. In the ring, the fans rallied the dragon on, and he managed to make a comeback. He skinned the cat, dove over the ropes before hitting another axe handle, and again, he shows that he's still better than most of the roster. He evades Y2J's attacks. It was cool. The best in the world, however, kept up. Back and forth action from both men. The crowd certainly believed the dragon could win it. Jericho goes for the walls, but again, Steamboat countered into an inside cradle. Rough blow to the back, yet Ricky dodges a slam, only to walk into the code breaker. One, two, three. Cool. It was expected to see those legends struggle, but it wasn't expected of Ricky Steemo to make the main roster guys look a bit bad. This performance pales in comparison to Backlash, but still it was a memorable moment. To see him give everybody flashbacks to the late 80s with the axe handles and crossbodies. Wow, awesome stuff. The match itself was decent given the talent Jericho was working with, and as for Ric Flair, he wasn't pleased with the results and quickly went after the five-time world champion. He managed to deliver several chops, clubbing chops to Jericho, but he walked into a high back body drop. Jericho hits the code breaker and there's no happy ending. But since this was healed Jericho, he of course managed to screw up. He grabbed a mic and called himself the best in the world, bragged about getting rid of the washed up talents and then he shifted his focus to Mickey Rourke who's chilling with Frank Shamrock. Speaking of Frank Shamrock, I just discovered a very hilarious story about Vince McMahon being ready to take him on. This is what Jericho said in an interview. So Jericho was explaining to Vince that Mickey Rourke brought Frank Shamrock in for protection because he feared that they'll double cross him and make him look bad at WrestleMania, right? So this is what he said. I say to Vince that he brought those guys here to attack me in case there was a fight. Vince said, those guys? He points to Shamrock and said, he's a midget. What's that midget going to do? Me, you, Finley, and Malenko will kick their asses. I said, well, let me tell you this, Vince. If something breaks out, I'll take Mickey Rourke and you take the midget. He said, you're damn right I will. This story just got me laughing due to the fact that Vince didn't even know who the hell Frank Shamrock was. Chris Jericho challenged him to come into the ring and apologize for what he said, and he threatened to exit the ring and slap his face if he doesn't enter. Rourke ends up accepting this little challenge much the excitement of the fans of Jack gets off, he slowly climbs up the steps and enters the ring. So after three months, they were finally gonna come to blows. Now one thing to mention is the fact that Rourke wasn't just some celebrity slouch, he was actually a professional boxer in the past. He quickly brought the punches to Jericho who was caught off guard, but despite this he continued trying to make his attempt only to be caught with a left hook, and that's all she wrote. Ric Flair comes in and raises his hand as if he accomplished something. Rourke did appear on SmackDown about a month later when Jericho continued criticizing him I should know. But yeah, this was a cool moment seeing Ricky the Dragon Steamboats showing that he still got it. Other than that, it was certainly weak. The Steamboat arcs elevate this match. The next match was Extreme Rules, brother versus brother, Matt Hardy meets Jeff Hardy. Okay, I'm just gonna shamelessly promote a video I made on this feud last year. Long story short, Matt Hardy was jealous over the fact that he's seen as a lesser Hardy. I mean, who could blame him? His brother's WWE champion and he's ECW champion. So he makes Jeff's life a living hell. He nearly killed him in a pyro accident and burned his house down, I think, and was continuously trying to get Jeff to fight back. It took a while and it wasn't until Matt revealed that little secret. To date, off the top of my head, this is the second only sibling WrestleMania match. Third, if you want to include Kane and The Undertaker. And damn, just looking at Matt Hardy, complete mood killer at this point. By the looks of it, WWE was going to give him a long overdue push, but as a heel. It wasn't well liked by many, but looking at the positives, it was different, I guess. Also, I just got to mention the fact that I still don't understand how you can slam or slap a tornado. Jeff Hardy, on the other hand, you just had to be there to see it. He was over with the entire audience and was unlike everyone else. The mysterious charisma the guy had won over everyone, and he finally managed to reach the pinnacle of WWE. But once again, external activities got in the way, and so he left was released. Conflicting reports either way. Immediately, Jeff delivers a slap that would make Boozy proud. A poster is brought in and he slams it right through his head. Trash can, I mean the main event WrestleMania 25, attempt wasn't to be, but it didn't halt Jeff's momentum. He ended up taking one risk too many, well actually two risks, and Matt's finally back in. He brings in a freaking drive back, which I've never seen before in a WWE arena, and in the ring, Hardy has the side effect kick out from Jeff. Matt continues the rough offense before bringing in a table, and as he's going for a suplex, Jeff evades it and hits a clothesline off the apron. Little mule kick and the kendo sticks are in. Fans finally get excited with Jeff's extreme PG, I should know, offense. This gets him a near fall, however. Hardy goes for a swan time to no avail, and luckily for Matt, he connects with the twist of fate. Unfortunately, this wasn't enough for the three count. Jeff blessed Matt with a steel chair before planting him on the table, but he wasn't satisfied. So he put the table right on top of his older brother before connecting with the crossbody. Successful! The other camera angles make this seem so much cooler. Like, I recall seeing a bunch of replays and it was way, 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 way better. Still a cool spot. This would have gotten Jeff the W, but unfortunately, Matt put his foot on the rope, and so the ladders are brought in. 
a ladder taller than the amount of talent WWE has de-pushed. And just by looking at this image, you know where this is going. Jeff Howard didn't see it coming and Matt moved out of the way, and so now he's got a broken ass and his big brother was going to take advantage. How you say? With a twist of fate using a steel chair, one, two, three, Matt wins. Definitely the biggest victory in his career. If you look at it from that time period's perspective, Matt definitely needed more than Jeff. Hell, if you look at it from today's perspective, he needed it more than his little brother. You'd think it was going to lead to this big heel Matt push, but it fizzled out faster than Rey Mysterio's Tuttle in 2011. Not a bad match, it's close to good, but I feel it was missing something. A small thing was missing in my eyes, but still a positive from this WrestleMania. Not a huge positive, though. The next match is for the Intercontinental Championship. JBL defends the gold against Rey Mysterio. Right before the match, JBL insulted his old home state, saying that the Texas natives need hope and that's when he comes in. As for Rey Mysterio, he's donning a nice Joker outfit, paying tribute to Heath Ledger in the Dark Knight film, which came out about a year earlier, and oddly enough, the commentary team reminded us that this was Rey's first WrestleMania three years. Like, it just doesn't feel like it. There's this awkward mention of Heath Ledger's death. I don't know why they said it, but when I heard it while watching, I, I just thought it was odd. But right beforehand, JBL delivered a big boot to Rey before the bell even rang, but despite the assault, Mysterio wanted the match to start. It would prove to be a huge mistake coming from JBL as Ray kicked him in the head at the 619 and beat him in 21 seconds. That's all. I believe it was a WrestleMania record at the time. JBL was so embarrassed by the loss that he grabbed the mic, told the fans that he's got something to say. The fans certainly didn't want to hear it when JBL opened up that big mouth. He said two words and no, they weren't wrestling God. It was I quit and so he's done. That's it. John Bradshaw Layfield was gone. He argued with the fans and this gave me flashbacks to kid me like I just absolutely despised JBL. This guy, he was on a whole other level in terms of generating heat. Definitely up there with Triple H and Edge as the best characters from the 2000s that could generate heat. The reason why Bradshaw retired was because of his back and neck. He had underlying issues which was the entire reason he retired in 2006. This little announcement was a cool way for him to go out because it stays true to his character. You know, he had enough of the fans and was gonna run back to New York City. The next match, well, it's Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker, two iconic legends finally going at it after 11 years. Ever since 2007, the match has been teased. They had an incredible showdown of epic proportions at the Royal Rumble in San Antonio, and both guys were in form, especially HBK. He was super in form at this point. He was having classics on a monthly basis against the likes of Y2J, John Cena, and after freeing himself from JBL, was living quote-unquote heaven on earth. The build to that match is a bit awkward because Kozlov and JBL got involved, but once that was over with, it was fun. They began sticking into each other, HBA claimed he won't have an engraved tombstone, he super kicked The Undertaker, and best of all, had this little ceremony where he was all dressed in white provoking the dead man. It was all building to a collision course in Houston. HBK was acting a bit heelish as he occasionally does, so it was gonna be cool. I should note that the match itself was planned for several months. It's obvious this was back when WWE used to plan WrestleMania matches ahead, but I found a little internet article that stated Bruce Prichard was fired a few days before the leak actually spoiled it. HK also alluded to a future match with The Undertaker in a radio interview back in November 2008. Regardless, this damn match was a long, and I mean long time coming, and they delivered it in a way which you were very thankful that the match took this long to happen. Sometimes it is hell trying to get to heaven. Michaels has got to go through hell in order to attain bliss, which is metaphorically speaking the streak, I guess? Battle of Darkness versus Light, ah, you get it. Shawn Michaels made a glorious descent from the heavens wearing a white jacket and a white hat as opposed to The Undertaker's dark colors. At this point in time, The Undertaker was 16 and 0 and already the guys had everything they needed. A story, atmosphere, setting, all that. Both men stood face to face for the first time in years and so the bell rings. Immediately, Michaels goes for several chops, but when Taker fights back, he feigns a knee injury, but it's for nothing. The Undertaker corners him, and this is when the commentary team reminded us that he's never beaten HBK. In the ring, Michaels takes a big back body drop, a press slam, and an elbow, and he was trying to go after the arm in the very early going. The crowd was half and half at this point. Taker successfully hits old school, but despite this, his speed got the best of him, and HBK is back in it. The leg that he sort of worked on was locked in the figure four, and Jar explained this simply, and I'm pretty sure you know this. HVK wanted to take out the vertical base in order to prevent a choke slam or even a tombstone. This idea seemed to work for Michaels despite the fact that The Undertaker was on offense. Snake eyes and a boot, even a leg drop gives Taker the first near fall in the match. As he's going for the choke slam, Michaels abruptly counters into the sharpshooter, and now you can hear the boots. The man struggled but managed to roll around. 
for a pin attempt, but despite this, Michaels was like a pit bull. He refused to let go and was hard-headed. The Undertaker had to lift him above and hit a sidewalk slam, and again, it's a two count. They engaged in a slugfest before Michaels brought out the anger in the Undertaker, but he still wouldn't budge, and he did well hitting the forearm. Nice kip up, inverted atomic drop, and he was really well aware of the guy he's facing. Finding this, he goes up top, Owens get caught by Taker. Nope. Fake out leads to the figure four. Not that either. Taker catches him with Hell's Gate. Luckily for the heartbreak, Kid, he managed to reach the ropes, and the Undertaker then slowed down the pace, opting to hit the apron leg drop, but like the XFL in 2001, failed. A little baseball slide from Michaels leads to a moonsault, which the Undertaker managed to dodge, and things were bad at this point. It wasn't good. The ref Marty Elias was preparing to stop this match, and all of a sudden, the Undertaker hits that dive, but not to Michaels, but instead to a cameraman, and worst of all, he landed on his damn neck. Of course, I have to mention that Sim Snook, but you already know that. If you don't know, now you know. Michaels managed to recover and desperately crawl into the ring before realizing, I can win this by countout. It took some convincing, but Marty Elias gave in. Slowly but rapidly to The Undertaker, the ref was reaching the count of 10. Michaels was desperately eyeing that victory, but it wasn't to be. And because of this, it meant more work. So he decides to tune up the band. Sweet choke slam out of nowhere. One, two, he kicked out. Okay, now we are reaching the zenith of the match. Choke slam attempt wasn't to be, but the sweet chin music certainly was. But Michaels couldn't go for the cover though, and when he did, it was a near fall. He kips up and walks into a choke slam. Nope. Counter into a counter and boom! Last stride and the damn height taker got on it was pretty damn incredible. By the looks of it, the match would have been over here, but again, Michaels kicked out. I'm pretty certain if you look at it from that time period, it would have caught you off guard. Taker went up top to hit an elbow, and damn what a loud thud that was. <laughs> Once both men recover, Sean gets thrown over the top rope, but skins the cat only to walk into the Undertaker's attempt at the tombstone. Successful. That's it. Nobody kicked out of the tombstone at WrestleMania barring Kane except for Michaels. Yep. He just didn't want to stay down. Whenever the Undertaker hit tombstone, that was it. But this time around, Michaels was still in it in JR's commentary line. The way he said it, I just had an out-of-body experience. It's definitely, definitely one of his most memorable calls for sure. Because of the tombstone, the Undertaker was in shock. He couldn't believe it, nor did the fans. And Michaels was still down, so he had to lift him up only to walk into a tornado DDT. Again, he desperately tried crawling to the ropes in order to get himself up and hit that elbow. The elbow connects, but he knew that this guy wasn't going to stay down for a count. He knew that for a fact, and so he tuned out the band, and again, it worked. So was the prophecy fulfilled? Nope. Both men forcefully lifted each other up, only to engage in a thunderous slugfest. Ooh, yeah, ooh, yeah. And in the end, The Undertaker won this battle with a clubbing blow. He goes for another tombstone, but again, HVK escaped. Taker once again gets ahead of himself and walks to an elbow, and as for Michaels, he felt it was the right move to hit a moonsault. But unfortunately, The Undertaker catches him, and you can see him try to escape with all his fiber being, but it wasn't to be, and The Undertaker hit the tombstone pile driver. One, two, three, greatest WrestleMania match of all time, there I said it. You know, the only two matches I can fairly give that claim to are Austin and Brett and the triple threat at WrestleMania 20. Any of those matches can match this one, and it's up to you to determine whether or not they're the greatest match in WrestleMania history. But for me, this is it. Is it my favorite WrestleMania match of all time? No. That actually goes to Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker WrestleMania 26. This one, it just came out of nowhere. Best match of 2009, regardless of its TNA, All Japan, New Japan, WWE, whatever. This was the best match of 2009 for sure. It's like one of those matches that in my eyes helped shape up a future of WWE main events, you know, the kickouts, the false finishes. This match was what WrestleMania is all about. A tremendous amount of virtue I have for the match and most importantly the competitors. They laid their bodies out there like nobody else did on that night and completely bedazzled and ran off with that show unlike anybody else. Truly a legendary affair that resplendent and transcended every other match WWE had in 2009. It's a must watch. For sure both men's greatest singles match and it was so good that it sucked out the energy the fans had. Hell, even the commentary team were exhausted. It was a grandiose, awe-inspiring affair that to this day is still spoken about. Yes, 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 definitely five stars. This match is perfect. The little Sim Snooker spot in my eyes really added to the match. You know, it caused a little bit of uncertainty. It's like, oh, he might lose it. They added more drama, so I don't think that was a big issue. I don't even think it was a minor issue, let alone. Now, what I do find out about this match is the fact that they were initially going to go at it for 15 minutes. Taker and Sean managed to convince them to get more time, but unfortunately couldn't get that main event spot. In an interview with Ed Milet in June of last year, The Undertaker spoke about his match with Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25. And I quote, That's just how great he is. It's fun to be able to work with guys like that because I don't have to worry about them. He's not intimidated because he's in the ring with The Undertaker. So I don't have to worry about what Shawn Michaels is going to do because I know 
he's going to do Shawn Michaels and that allows Undertaker to do Undertaker and because there was incredible chemistry there was just a phenomenal result that did put a little bit of a chip on our shoulder the Undertaker said you, you have to want to live for those moments that's the comparison to being six points down in the Super Bowl and you're on your own 10 yard line you want those moments if you want to be great and consider yourself one of the greats you want that drive that'll push you down the field and score you want to steal a show at WrestleMania if you don't want to steal a show at WrestleMania you shouldn't be there it's not always going to happen but you have to have that desire and if you don't desire to have those moments you're missing out on the whole big picture of it what the hell am I supposed to say I said everything I can about this match the next match is for the World Heavyweight Championship. Edge defends the gold against the Big Show and John Cena. The story for this one was quite odd. First of all, I read up on old reports that taught me initially Cena and Edge were going to face off in a singles match, but since they had 100 matches on Raw and pay-per-view, they were all good, I should note. They felt somebody needed to be added in order to make things a little bit fresher. So the Big Show is brought in. He was initially going to compete in the Money in the Bank ladder match, rumor has it once again, and he was actually pegged to win the entire thing, which I find quite odd. But, on WWE photo shoot two years ago, and I distinctively remember this, the Big Show revealed that John Cena was the one who wanted him in this match. He pitched the idea to creative, and because of that, Big Show was in a major world title match at WrestleMania. As for the build, it was weird because Big Show was Vicky's secret lover, meaning she was cheating on Edge, but despite this, she still loved him, and Cena was the guy on the outside who was going to capitalize on this drama. Also, Edge initially stole the title in an Elimination Chamber match that he wasn't even booked to be in, and after this, the title match in Houston was supposed to be Edge vs. Big Show, which reminds me of the Rocks promo 2000, you know, WrestleMania is gonna absolutely suck. But John Cena had a little secret that forced Vicky to add him to the match. It was revealed, and so that's how the match was made. So the two heels made their entrances normal stuff, but when John Cena came out, well, a thousand of him appeared. Real Slim Shady vibes. Not only that, but Cena's old world life song was played. Pyro goes out and his current song plays and out he emerges, tries to take it all in, knowing not many of them come often and there's the iconic Wrestlemania shot. Big Show received booze, Cena received a mixed reaction, the fans were leaning towards booze with Edge which you could hear the cheers. Also I gotta mention the fact that the brand split was more broken than WWE 2K20 at this point. The bell rings and Cena immediately tries bringing the fight. Little Bulldog but the Big Show makes his presence felt and because of this Edge realized that there should be an alliance. Unfortunately he did that little thing from SVR, Edge walks into the FU but Big Show makes the save with a boot that Michael Cole didn't forget to mention was a size 5 E boot. And a little one on one action between Cena and Show goes down, all while Vicky's torn. You know, her lover's in the ring and her other lover's down on the ground. Anyway, Cena and Edge unintentionally worked as a unit to knock down the big show. And this leads to the one on one match that should have went down at the event. Edge catches Cena with execution, goes up top only to take a right, and Big Show's back in. Slow stuff, and Cena tries fighting back, but gets tripped by Chavo, who I forgot even existed, honestly. He takes an FU, and in the ring, John catches Big Show on the ropes and begins his comeback. He's shouting, you suck, but there was nothing to do. Vicky causes a distraction, ends up getting speared, and Edge's reaction is as if he spilled coffee onto Kane. Big Show gets on tight, and now Big Show's in control. He was damn near unstoppable. Even an FU, AA, whatever it was called at the time, was countered into the KO, punched on the outside he attempts to choke slam edge through the table but ends up taking a ddt because of this edge had to hit a super spear through the barricade and he proceeded to focus on one john cena the ultimate opportunist goes for the spear but walks into the stf the world champion nearly reached her up so cena dragged him away this time it took big show breaking the submission hold for him to escape he tried squashing edge but fails and because big show's a giant shocking i know cena and edge had to team up in order to suplex him and now i want to see an edge and cena tag team but before i could even think of the possibilities edge wags him Still wasn't enough to stop Cena. It took Big Show shoving him off the top into Edge's shoulders, who hit a damn spear. I don't remember that moment at all. Heels go out of Edge with the sleeper when John Cena comes in and unbelievably lifts both men in AA position. It's ridiculous. Like, we all know he can lift the Big Show, which is an accomplishment in itself, but two men. Brute strength and force right there. Edge falls off. Messina hits the AI on Big Show before catching Edge with it. One, two, three, good. I got hearing about how bad this WrestleMania is. I had low expectations for this one. It wasn't bad, it was somewhat good. Cool spots that I completely forgot about. Everyone looked good for the most part, and you can't tell me this wasn't better than the main event. The double AA spot is still spoken about to this day, and it's insane seeing John lift a guy who weighs over 250 pounds and a 450 pound man for a few seconds. I gotta mention that Cena was initially gonna face Batista, hence this weird match, but yeah, good match. Crowd was into it for the most part. It would, however, die down a few minutes later, though. Following this, the 2009 Hall of Fame inductees came out. You know, the Funks, Dorian Terry, Coco Beware, who many thought was an odd inclusion, LeVon Eriks, Bill Watts, Howard Finkel, Ricky the Dragon, Steemo, and of course, Stone Cold Steve Austin. 
and it's a star-studded class. The inductees came out, Justin Roberts introduced him, and just seeing Coco Beware gave me mad Legends of WrestleMania vibes. Stone Cold then decided to bring out the ATV, and I mean, there was no chance of him missing WrestleMania in his home state, right? He cracked the cold one with good old JR before riding to the back. There was a little commercial hype up WrestleMania 26, which I'm more inclined to cover after watching HBK vs. Taker, and Lillian Garcia announced the attendance record was set then and there, and it was time. Triple H defends the WWE Championship against Randy Orton, okay. This match was deserving of the main event of WrestleMania, you can't say otherwise. It had the best buildup of any match, but had they foreseen how things went, I have no doubt in my mind that he made a different decision. With that said, Orton punted McMahon and won the Rumble, and after that, he threatened to sue the company if they fire him. Orton then went through Shane, RKO'd Stephanie, because of this, he got Triple H's attention. Then things got even further with Hunter paying a visit to his house. Orton DDT'd his wife and kissed her, and it was a very fury buildup. I mean, we're just thinking about that buildup, it's absolutely insane. Right before the match, the McMahon family were nodding, and it was revealed that if Triple H gets disqualified, he loses the title. Who made this decision? Vicky Guerrero and Kayfabe. That shot in itself is iconic. SVR 2010 vibes with Triple H's entrance. He breaks his big ass glass, which only served to curse the quality of this match, and the crowd was pretty silent. The guys are staring at holding each other until the bell rings. After a few, Triple H brings the fight. He was losing control, pushing the ref away, but he managed to convince him to stop. Because of this, Randy Orton caught with the RKO, and after this, pun attempt goes south, and boom, pedigree. Triple H whoops his ass on the outside, but the crowd was exhausted. He was letting his temper get the best of him, and Orton had to get on his knees, and even then, that wasn't enough to stop Triple H. He went after that shoulder, and yes, the crowd was as dead as The Undertaker. Orton ran to the outside, encountered the Irish whip, buying his time, and he then sends Triple H over the barricade, and there wasn't much of a reaction to this. He beats the count, and Randy Orton begins the dice. Section. The crowd were enjoying themselves not watching the match. I don't know what the hell they were doing. Headlock is countered into a back suplex, but it wasn't enough to derail the Orton train. Back to the chin lock. They engage in the little slugfest that Orton lost. Face buster, knee, but the pedigree wasn't to be any. Walks into a catapult, but rebounds with a clothesline. Despite this, Orton bounced back by sending Triple H face first into the turnbuckle. A little countering sequence, and at least a spine buster, and again, the pedigree didn't work. And yes, the match just wasn't that interesting. Cool drop kick from Orin though, as he goes for the punt, Hunter blocks and sends him to the outside where he contemplated whether or not to get DQ'd. He should have. Pedigree just wasn't working on this night, and Orin hits the DDT, but despite this, he beat the count, and Randy wasn't incensed. Several corner strikes, ref gets knocked down, and boom! RKO, but it was no biggie because he brings in a sledgehammer. From out of nowhere, Triple H punts him, Orin's down, but once he gets a sledgehammer shot, Triple H the babyface hides the evidence, delivers hundreds of rights, and JR on commentary was doing his best to salvage this. Triple H hits the pedigree, one, two, three, that's it. This match was the definition of boring. Why? Well, let me explain it to you simply. A WrestleMania main event needs to have excitement. It needs to have drama. It needs to have action. This match lacked every single one of those traits. I came into this match with low expectations again watching it now, and I was disappointed. I really thought there was going to be something decent there, but it was boring as hell. The crowd at WrestleMania shouldn't be that silent. Now, are they to blame? Hold on. Of course, you gotta mention the fact that HBK and Taker stole the show, but this one, though, there wasn't much there. Like, all I could think of was the pedigree spot, the sledgehammer, that's all. Like, what, what else? WWE really screwed up by booking this match to be a singles match, a basic singles match, and it should have been no holds barred or hell in a cell or something chaotic. Also, it, it needed to be Attitude Era quality. What I mean by that is you have Legacy interfere, the McMahons come out, they brawl, crazy stuff like that. The match just shouldn't have went down the way it did. The story just didn't make sense. Like, Triple H shouldn't have to worry about the title at this point because this is the same man that punted his brother-in-law and kissed his unconscious wife. It is the one of the worst main events in WrestleMania history. It ain't like WrestleMania 18 where it was actually good but the crowd was dead, no. It was bad. It was bad. It's forgettable. Okay, that's the main event. Definitely the weakest WrestleMania main event of the 2000s. No doubt about it. And that's WrestleMania 25. Honestly, this show, it was lacking some good matches. Man Hardy and Jeff, that was nearly good in my eyes. Triple Threat was good. HVK Taker, well, you guys know what's up. And the money in the bank. Other than that, there wasn't much here. The Jericho match wasn't that good. It was the Ricky Steamboat and spots that salvaged it in my eyes. And the Miss WrestleMania thing is the worst. And yeah, that's the event. It lacked some excitement, I guess. I really came in with low expectations, even then they weren't met. Add to that, there wasn't a tag team match, you know, the John Morrison and Miz versus Primo and Carlito, the Colognes tag match. That should have been featured. They might have added a bit excitement to the event. So yeah, WrestleMania 25 was weak. And I'm off to cover other WrestleManias like 19, 21, 22, 
hopefully. 24, 26. I'm going to do a bunch of them this month, hopefully. So, yeah. What did you guys think of WrestleMania 25? Please comment down below. And that's it for this video. Make sure you hit an AA on the like button and perhaps a punt on the subscribe button. Peace. I'm out.